Welcome everyone to our Meet the Faculty webinar. Um, our guest is Alan Jagelinzer, Professor of Accounting at the Cambridge Judge Business School. If you have any questions, please type those in the Q&A box and we'll do our best to answer them. Alan is a Professor of Financial Accounting at the University of Cambridge Judge Business School and he's also the Director of the Center for Financial Reporting and Accountability. Uh, Alan has published papers in top journals in accounting and finance on topics including financial reporting, international accounting, corporate governance, executive compensation, and insider trading. He's also been a fellow at the International Accounting Standards Board in London. And Alan is one of the faculty uh, who has been heavily involved in the development of the Cambridge Executive Master of Accounting program. So let's start there, Alan. What led you to come to Cambridge? and build a Master of Accounting program here? Well, thanks for hosting, Mike. Um, that's a wide open question. A lot of it was because I had a sense that accounting is evolving, but we didn't have the infrastructure to support the evolution to where we need to go. Um, it was multiple data points for me throughout. I, I mean, I think I've trained thousands of students who have gone off into the accounting profession and many of them came back to me several years later with stories of dissatisfaction. They were frustrated or they didn't understand the whole purpose of what they were trying to do and they wanted to make change. And many of them were asking me, how do I leave the profession because I'm done or I want to, you know, it's, it's not a good fit for me. And I think instead what we started to do was we started to have a conversation about how to change the environment in which they're operating. What are the core fundamental elements where if we could modify how they were engaging the work, if we could actually make the impact more clear, clearer for them, if we could actually elevate their role, if we could actually do more societal impact, would they stay? And, and many of them said yes. And it was this idea of how do we move that way? Um, I had previously worked at Stanford and um, at Stanford Business School, it's a lot about design thinking and about uh, entrepreneurship and developing change initiatives and always couched in a societal impact framework. And I was inspired by that and I said, well, we badly need this type of thinking in accounting and in finance career paths because there's so many opportunities for us to expand as well. So as you know, because you're, you're involved with it, um, the entire space around environmental reporting and social and governance reporting is wide open. There's, there's a lot of movement in that direction, but there's also a lot of lack of clarity around how we should do it. What are we really aiming to do? And accountants tend not to have the change and the design teaching. We don't really teach that. We tend to teach technically through our training programs. And I said, well, we need to create design and policy oriented thinking. And that was the impetus or kind of the, the catalyst, I should say, for this. And Cambridge was one of the few institutions on the planet where you can genuinely bring in global mindset, global resources, including people who are looking at the same kind of problems, but from completely different perspectives. And I said, we, we can build that infrastructure here at Cambridge. And that's what brought me here. So um, in your answer, you used the word change a number of times. I heard that word coming up a lot. And um, one of the classes you teach in the program is change management. And by the way, uh, I know that you've won numerous teaching awards everywhere you've worked. Um, so we're really happy to have you as a, as a teacher in, in multiple classes in the Executive Mac program. Anyway, change management. Um, what's that about? What's your approach to thinking about change management? Why do people working in accounting need to know about change management? I have been in many positions where I felt like change was needed because we weren't able to do the job efficiently or we had lost track as a, as a community, either because we had leadership who'd lost sight of what we were trying to do um, or because we didn't have leadership at all. And, and I, I realized that a lot of what we want to accomplish is through change. Every, every many, many, many types of things that we want to do require change. And with every change initiative, there's resistance around every change initiative. And as I started looking at our career space, I noticed, for example, we're changing financial reporting standards quite frequently. That's happening. The Financial Accounting Standards Board, the International Accounting Standards Board are inherently change agencies. And my immersion there realized that they are a change organization. 
we're, the evolution we talked about into environmental and social reporting, that's a change initiative. We're also looking at changes around audit practice and audit policy because in many cases, some of our audits aren't particularly working effectively. We also had changes that were forced upon us with COVID, for example, and how we changed even our work practice. And what I learned just watching is that accountants don't really understand change. We tend to resist change. In fact, many accountants come in because there are expectations around rules. And if they understand the rules and if they can compute um, answers correctly, then they do well professionally. So there's structure in accountancy, which tends to draw people in because there's sort of a, a platform or there's a, there's a plan for them and how they progress. Inherently though, all of that infrastructure is under stress. Um, and a lot of that requires creative thinking about how are we gonna do things better? Why are we doing what we're doing? So I've actually done a lot of change initiatives inherently because I, I see and I get agitated by when things are inefficient or um, I just recognized even in my prior career in the military, we had to make decisions quickly and we had to kind of decide what we're gonna do and we would have to change course very quickly for reasons either we chose to do for um, because it was the right thing to do collectively or because it was forced upon us by some circumstance. And I, I basically said, okay, how does one approach change? And I brought in a bunch of projects and frameworks for change thinking. One of the ways in which I approach the change management course is to first get students who typically don't see themselves as owners of change to realize that ownership of change can happen at any point with any title. You don't need a specific title to be a change leader. You just have to say, I'm going to help catalyze a change initiative because it's important to me. So one of the things, I think the very first thing I try to get across to students is you can facilitate change if you care enough about it. It's okay to generate change. And um, the second piece is what are we trying to change and why do I care about it? And one of the key things is to communicate that we have to care about the change to see it through. And so we do a lot of work on trying to figure out like what is the very specific change objective? Why is it important to me? What am I trying to accomplish? What does change look like? If I can go from here to here, can I visualize the difference and why is it so important to me? And simple examples, I visited a university in Hong Kong as an advisor and everybody in that institution with whom I spoke was interested in shifting the start time of their courses 30 minutes later in the morning because it would help facilitate the commute into the campus. And that's a simple change initiative. And I asked them, why do you care about that? And they explained because it's incredibly difficult to get to campus. And there was a lot of shared caring around that. But somebody has to champion the change initiative. So it's the ownership, the caring, and the simplicity. And we spend a lot of time on what is all of that. Then we finally move into a systems approach about breaking it down into pieces, trying to identify staging. At what point do we need to start stages so that we can move change through its processing? And most importantly, is who is going to resist that change initiative? Why are they going to resist the change initiative? And then are there ways in which we can bring them on board? And, and that helps, gets into a discussion around communication of the change initiative, getting people to buy into it, um, and also sourcing the resources required. The whole point of the change program is to say that our profession needs change agents. It needs people who can bring change together and lead it. And there are huge opportunities for growth in our space if you can coordinate a community around a change movement and then show you how one can bring change along and actually initiate that. So um, you, you had a prior career before you were an accounting professor. True. You, you, you were a, in the US military, you were a pilot. Can you t tell us how you got from that career to this career and what did you learn? What, how did that shape your teaching and your research and your thinking and what you do now? Yeah, I spent 10 years in the active United States Air Force military as an instructor pilot primarily, and then I also flew a radar platform, an early warning radar platform. And 
Um, I think a lot, particularly in the latter, when I was doing that, I think a lot of what I learned from that was first the ability to work in a community. We had a crew of 40 and at age 25 I was responsible for their lives and to get them in and out of certain areas where we had to operate safely. And that was an incredibly complex thing to do, to try, first of all, just to get the people to show up on time. I mean, just imagine, speaking of a change initiative, if you have to change the start time and you have 40 people to show up at the same time, that it's, a, it's an incredibly complex problem for a simple task. So a lot of it was just trying to figure out how to work people so that we could actually move and, and, and launch an airplane, which was challenging, but also thinking in terms of how to be flexible and how to pivot when things go weird. So we had a lot of ep episodes where weather was bad or we ran out of fuel for some reason, or I mean, I had several issues where we blew a tire on landing because the anti-lock brakes didn't uh, release. And so we were de dealing with emergency evacuations and things like that. So there's a lot of crazy. And so it's a matter of real time adjusting on the fly to, to the uh, catalysts that come in. One of the biggest things I think I learned from that was risk assessment. How to, how to think through risky, uncertain types of scenarios and how to, which I introduced in the change, since you mentioned the change management course, we do some work on risk and thinking about risk and processing risk. Because a lot of hesitance to change is fear of risk or fear of uncertainty or fear of potential bad outcomes. And instead of simply go, oh, I'm afraid of something bad happening, we actually do what, what I learned to do, which was name it. What is the bad thing specifically? And then what's the probability of that happening? And what can we do to do mitigation of risk around that bad thing? And how can we think through all of the potential scenarios that might arise as we're going through the initiative and try to set up systems so that the chances go lower that we'll ever get there? Um, and so it's a framing on, on risk and uncertainty that we go through. And it's, it's been incredibly helpful, I think, to think through. And we do some exercises around it in, in um, hypothetical cases around risk, risk to travel are some examples that we do. How could you plan a particular travel route that mitigates risks? What do the risks look like and things like that? And, and this, a lot of it was based on my military experience. So is it true then that the only cooler job than jet pilot is accounting professor? Absolutely. True. I think so too. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I, I would say that's yeah, true yeah. for sure. Um, so you mentioned people. Um, and it, it, interesting thing about describing this task of, of, of flying and, and, and these, these missions is it a lot of it, you mentioned fear, you know, fear and people and, and we have a, uh, a module in the Executive Mac program called Interpersonal Dynamics. What on earth is that? It relates to the change project. And it also comes um, a little bit from ideation from one of the prior universities I, I worked through, where I, I understood from their version of this course, it, every objective we want is done in a human system. In other words, if we want to, no change happens by yourself. No initiative happens by yourself. No company gets started by yourself. You always rely on human beings to support whatever it is you're going to do. And the way we enter a room and the way we interact with human beings will directly affect our success rate on anything we set out to do. And a lot of this is trying to understand how we interact with other people. We have a tendency as human beings to pay more attention to other people's stuff and not enough to our own stuff. And what I mean by our own stuff is that I might see what you're doing, but I'm not really paying attention to what you're doing is having an effect on my own emotional energy. And then I'm reacting to you and we get into a feedback loop. And so, and we see this in literally every relationship. It could be parental with our children. It could be work relationships. And, and, and it creates problems in how we communicate and whether we can collaborate. And so this is a, a workshop that allows us to understand who we are when we involve ourselves in group dynamics. And often we have to learn from other people telling us this because we're not aware of ourselves. Even 
the most confident people. I would say that some of the people who show up as most confident are often the least aware that when they walk into a room with a lot of confidence, they change the dynamic of the room and their presence might actually make some people not speak out. And these, are might, these might be people who are really brilliant and could offer a lot of insight. But the fact that I'm the boss and I enter the room, that changes the entire atmosphere of the room. And particularly if I lead off and set the tone for a meeting, for example, if I'm the first to speak in a meeting, then everybody's anchored to what I just placed into the space. And I might not realize that I've actually limited the ideation around what's happening by starting first. And our workshop allows us to experiment with that. So sometimes, for example, I might be the first to talk and other times I might want to talk, but then I'll stop myself and allow other people to talk and just watch and see if I can get more information and experiment with that and see whether I actually learn more and then I decide I can engage the room differently. And so it's, a, it's an experimental laboratory to allow us to become more aware of how we enter a room. Why is it important? Because as I noted in the change management discussion, every single change initiative has resistance even the simplest ones. We had, for example, a room full of students, and one of the students said, hey, can we show up tomorrow 15 minutes earlier? That's a change initiative, and the answer was like, no. And so this student had to figure out, okay, I'm in this social dynamic, in a group dynamic. Is there a way in which I can work this human system that has blocked me to try to find a way to where I can bring them over into my change space. So every single change initiative has some resistance and so a lot of it is trying to figure out how can I get people to work with me or in other contexts it's how do I get resources I need access to. So I want to do a project, I need money or I need somebody to say yes, I need access to a, a piece of land or I need access to equipment or I need access to your networks? How do I build trust with you so that you'll bridge me over to somebody who can help me? Um, and, and these are the kinds of things where you might not know who I am and so I have to be aware of myself to be able to communicate with you in a way where we build trust quickly so that if I say, could you please get me to Rachel or somebody else who can help me, you might be more willing to say yes to that. So that's why that course is incredibly important. And I'll close on this. The way we built it is such that the project that you'll do at the end of the interpersonal dynamics course is one that reflects back on the change management project so that you can think in terms of now that I'm more aware of human dynamics and psychology and how I interact with people, maybe that will help me think through different techniques I might be able to use to get resources or to get people to buy into my change initiative and come along with me on it. And, and why do you think this type of training uh, is needed or relevant for people working in accounting? As I said, I mean, accounting is moving quickly and even in the spaces, so there are obvious spaces where it's moving quickly. We mentioned several already, the audit practice is moving, changing dramatically. It has to change dramatically because people are questioning its value. And I value audit considerably, but I think we need improvement in it. And I think um, we need creative and efficient ways to earn better trust in that system. And I know you cover some of that in some of the coursework you do. And then, as I mentioned, even like the environmental social space, that's wide open. There are a lot of people moving in that space. There's a lot of money going into that space. And yet people don't really have a good feel for what we should be doing there. And that's a huge opportunity. But even there's opportunities that other people haven't even thought of yet. And in some of the work that I'm now doing, there's huge space I think in things like auditing um, AI technology and auditing even um, some of the work in like social media platforms if they're if we're going to impose digital service or what do we call it digital legislation there's uh, digital services acts Canada's launching one UK just launched one EU 
how does one enforce those? Who's doing the audits of those? Um, I have had conversations with many people who are techno technologically competent in computer programming, AI, some of the technology that they apply, but they don't really understand like what an audit represents, nor do they understand sort of the governance infrastructure that we have. And they're very interested in talking to us about how we can bridge together the two platforms so that we can create infrastructure to launch this, in my mind, a massive societal need to which there's going to be a lot of money spent to grow it in part because of legislation that's growing around the world. So I see opportunities and, and our students, one of the benefits of this program is our student, we don't even have, you and I don't even have to come up with the opportunities. I'm trying to see the idea that our students are creative enough inherently to come up with their own opportunities. So once we say, hey, be creative and bring design thinking, what can we do? How can we better leverage the sorts of skills that we normally do and we attribute to accounting? How can we leverage that to apply elsewhere? I think our students are inherently creative enough to come up with their own ideas on how to use it. And we're trying to create that design space so that it's free and we can have discussions and we can bring in people who are having these thinking, these, these thoughts. Uh, some of the colleagues we have locally in our senior advisory pool, these are the kinds of questions and discussions they're having. And they'd love to have um, partners in some of these dialogues. Yeah, I agree. I think that in, 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 we, we have systems and IT systems, ERP systems, and standards and procedures and governance in, in, in accounting. But to me, the underlying processes are human systems. Yes. And, and the production of financial statements, say an audit of financial statement, there is human judgment and human decisions involved at every step in that process. Mm -hmm. And no matter what your role is in that process, um, cultivating a better understanding of human systems and these dynamics, I think makes you more effective and a better decision maker. And it sounds like this interpersonal dynamics idea is about being able to participate in this system of communication and human interaction and also reflect and observe and understand and be sensitive to what's going on and how you're influencing that system. Is that fair sort of Absolutely, summary? yes, absolutely. It's also understanding too that what might work in one setting might not work in another mm. because you have a difference in culture or you have a difference in philosophy. And we can sit here all day and say, hey, this is gonna work in a UK environment, for example. This system will build a, technological system to govern, if you will, uh, an internal audit structure, something that has checks and balances within the system, but it may not translate elsewhere. And actually having the global footprint that we have here and having people in a room, I mean, we, we set up a room and we'll have whatever number of people and we will have some incredibly interesting discussions that we did not know before about how people process the same events and how people process the same type of language. And it, it allows us to understand that, hey, the system that I have in my head based on my own prior experience or based on what's happening in front of me now may not actually work over there. And it allows for more creative system development as well. And you know, every time there's a problem, there is an opportunity and um, a lot of people like to talk about the problems, but this is, and, and quite frankly, in our world right now, there are enormous problems. They're everywhere, and it's incredibly easy for all of us to just shut down because it's so overwhelming. And we're trying to get our students to say, yeah, it's overwhelming, but it's also an opportunity. I'm going to take this chunk here and own it, and then I'm going to bring in an ideation around the technology, like the technology, the learning, like the, the stuff we're learning about data and anal data analytics, AI, whatever we're going to bring in from a technological perspective, but I'm also going to bring in an understanding of the human beings I'm trying to affect, change with as a, as a community, and also, um, you know, the resistance pools and, and also how, once this thing gets implemented, how it might actually manifest in, in, a, in a society and how long it will happen. And also, Understanding human systems is also about marketing too. I mean, human beings are how we can price and whether we're going to be able to make a viable income from a new product. So every entrepreneur has to think in terms of human beings and understanding human systems because they're looking for funding, they're looking to sell product, they're looking to communicate to people, hey, this is value add. 
and you may not even understand the value add, so let's work together so I can communicate with you around it. Everything is around humans, everything. So you also teach a module called Global Financial Reporting in the Executive Mac program. So why would someone who, let's say, is a chartered accountant or a CPA, what would they get out of yet another class on financial reporting? They, we, we have, and I'm going to speak generally, we have a tendency to teach technically when we teach accounting and particularly financial reporting. Many, many students understand either IFRS or US GAAP, some, sometimes both. And so in many cases I could say, hey, we've got a scenario where you need to compute lease expense or whatever it is. And, and, and people have a tendency to know the mechanics, but we've, I was always one who said, well, why? Why do we do it this way? Does it make any sense? And I always question systems. I've been, the, I've been wired to question the why behind the system forever. And when I started getting more involved in financial reporting, I noticed that there were things that were super complicated and they were incredibly difficult for me to understand. In the United States, the pension accounting rules were one. I was like, none of this makes any sense. We would spend hours going through the rules on pension accounting. And it just felt like we were going through this matrix of rules. And I was like, I don't understand any of it. And then I was asking, well, why are we doing it this way? And what I started learning later was that there are these independent standard setters who are trying to figure out how do we communicate like un fundamental economic health of an enterprise. We need to be able to say this company is healthy and this company is not lying. And we have all these rules to try to do it, but a lot of the rules are flat out badly constructed. Poor, poor, poor communication. It's not that they're intended to be bad. It's not that they're cheating. It's just people don't understand or nobody really thought about like, is there a better way to communicate what's really happening? And some of the cases include, you know, we, we spend, pharmaceutical companies spend billions, if not trillions in US dollars of, of money every single year on research and development. And we, under both systems, typically call it just an expense which inherently says that it has zero useful value in the future. But we all know that you wouldn't spend billions and trillions of US dollars on, you wouldn't sit, throw it in an incinerator. You wouldn't just say, hey, let's go party with it and throw it away. Like there has to be value for you to chase down the opportunity that you might cure cancer, or you might you know, come up with some new vaccine for, for the next pandemic. And, 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 so our, our, our recording system is improperly communicating the potential value. And then that allows us to have dialogue with the standard setters about we need to change this because we need to better communicate the health. Um, it also allows us to sit down and look for the loopholes in the system. So somebody who might have intentions to lie because they want to scam us, where are the loopholes? Where the, where's the places that they can hide and cheat? And so we can have kind of a reverse engineer on that. And at the end of the day, I mean, I can't even say this more powerfully. We all rely, every human being on the planet relies on information to make judgments in every relationship in our lives. In the context of financial reporting, it's about business transactions primarily, but every relationship, whether we're gonna purchase a vehicle, purchase a home, get into a romantic partnership with somebody, Every relationship has information asymmetry. Somebody knows more than the other. The person who knows less is vulnerable and can be hurt if the person who knows more is lying. If you're doing a surgical procedure and your surgeon doesn't communicate that they're tired or they're, that they're not good at the procedure, you can be harmed. If you get into a romantic relationship and the person who knows more information says, you know, commun doesn't communicate the information, you can be hurt. And certainly in business transactions, you can easily be hurt. You can be taken advantage of. And so I think we all have to advocate for clean, accountable systems that as best as we can communicate what's really happening. What can we do better to facilitate a cleaner communication around what the health of this company is or this organization? And, and I want to make it clear, this isn't necessarily about corporations. We talk about corporations, but this is also governments. How many governments around the world are not being clean about where the money's going? And so the money is being squandered. They get 
tons of money and we don't know where it's going. And that's a societal problem. And I think we need better standards. I went to the International Accounting Standards Board. I spent time there and all of the discussion there, which I'm very proud of that organization, all that discussion was how can we do it better? How can we be cleaner? How can we communicate better standards? And one of the benefits of our program is we actually have Kumar. Um, I don't know if we're going to interview him at some point, but Kumar comes in and works with me in the GFR course. And he actually helped create a lot of the stuff that we work on in the international. He was with the staff of the International Accounting Standards Board. And a lot of the most complicated stuff that we do, particularly in the banking and the financial services industries, he directly made those changes. Um, and so he has a lot of perspective on that. And we can talk about why did they choose to do it this way? Could we have done it somewhere else? Where was the political influence in the system? And I think that's really interesting stuff. So it goes way beyond the technical. It goes into, it actually goes into the change thinking too. When we talk about the technical, I'm going to say, okay, we just reported it this way. But if I gave you the control rights, would you do it differently and how? Can you tell the standards board that they're messing it up and they should be doing it differently? Take ownership of the change initiative and tell them, no, we're not going to say that this is good enough. We need to do it better. And how? And, and that's the dialogue we have with the people who are making these decisions in the room. So this is co-taught by yourself, professor of accounting who's done extensive academic research on financial reporting, and uh, someone who was the technical director at the IESB, who, who knows why all the words are in there like they are. He, he was part of writing all the words, and we have networks of people who we are still in contact with who are not only with the standard setters, but also with the endorsement boards in different countries who get to decide whether the standards are appropriate for implementation. So that's, that's quite a unique view, then, on financial reporting that you don't get from it's, it's a holistic training. perspective. The one yeah. thing that I found missing in every course I took when I was learning the technical skills was the why. What's, this, what's the thinking behind all this? Why are we doing it this way? And, and once I understood the why, then I remembered the technical stuff so much better. Mm. I'm like, oh, okay, this is why. This makes sense. And actually, one of the things I teach as a, as a general rule to the students is if it's complicated, First of all, most financial reporting is incredibly simple and intuitive. If it's complicated, it's because some political actor messed it all up. So the reason why standards are really, really, really challenging is because somebody messed with it for political reasons. And that's a fun place to start. <laughs> and then we talk about who they were and why did they do it and how are they cheating the system now because they're getting away with it. So um, one of the things I, I've heard you mention a few times is um, societal impact, impact, right? So let's talk about the accounting profession. Um, you hear things to, you know, today just kind of swirling in the, in the news or whatever about the accounting profession in decline, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a questionable future for the accounting profession. What do you think is the future of the accounting profession? Where do, you, where do you think the accounting profession needs to go? And what do you think that leaders in the space need to be prepared for? I mean, come on, we have to put a stake in the ground to say that information is the most important. Information, is the, information quality is the most important societal imperative there is besides food and water. I mean, we have to have information clarity in order to be safe. And every bad decision that happens, whether it's a mistake that's made or whether it's intentional, happens because of misaligned information. We don't even start with that discussion. When we're doing accountancy, it's like, okay, we're gonna do all this technical stuff. And when we do, audit, I took an entire audit course and it was all about the audit opinion and audit letters and stuff like that. And I was like, what is this about? And I didn't understand at the end that this is about assurance so that people feel comfortable enough that it's building trust and there's like a security system there um, loosely. And, and I thought, oh, okay, that makes more sense. I feel more comfortable because somebody independently went in and checked the books, et cetera, and did, and did some analysis. I think that's critical. I mean, imagine the world right now. We have dark money floating through politics all around the world. We have um, all kinds of influences in social media without accountability on information. 
Uh, we need accounting-like systems throughout the entire infrastructure. And I think the accounting, if there's ever a dire need for leaders in accounting to get on top of information quality, it's right now. And that's a broad statement. Certainly in the financial systems, it's critical because even you know, the bank crisis, the Carillion scandal, societal harm because of a financial meltdown. Because companies we rely on lied to us about their financial health. We're talking people are homeless in the bank crisis, systemic risk throughout the world, massive recession, food poverty as a result of this because some people in banks were lying about their financial health and they were making incredibly intentionally poor choices and decisions that rippled throughout the world. The Carillion crisis here in the UK is another example where this is an infrastructure company that builds railways, hospitals. They were doing snow cleaning in Canada on their highways. And they were like, oh, hey, by the way, we're shutting down because we basically lied about our financial health. You know, that uh, hospitals here did not get built five years later, and they were like three or four X budget. So that's a massive societal problem. And that's just you looking at corporations, again, expand to governments. I mean, we spend how much tax money going into it? So when I hear, oh, the accountancy profession is dying, I'm like, that's because people aren't communicating properly around it. Um, I, think, I think we can do more. I think we can take a bigger stake. That's one of the reasons why I, I want partners to work with me to grow into the spaces that there's an absolute dire need for information quality um, certainly in the public space, too, I think we have value we could add. I mean, I've been sitting here talking to people who are in the trust and safety offices in social media, and they're kind of like, oh, what are you guys doing in your space? And, and just thinking in terms of whether they're analogs where we could help support that, I think, I, I think it would be very hard for anybody in the audience right now to argue with me that we have a crisis in confidence in information in all of our systems, whether it's newspapers or television or radio or social media. And it's a global problem. It's not United States, UK, Asia. It's, it's global. And I think this is our opportunity to step in. I think the problem is that we have so much entrenchment in our accounting communication and our profession and our systems that people think of accounting as a debit, credit, mechanical, technical exercise for compliance. And I, I, you and I were like, let's change that thinking. Let's talk. And this is why we invite senior partners from, and to be fair, senior partners at some of the firms agree with us and they're working on these things. It just doesn't necessarily communicate downward. And it certainly hasn't fully penetrated into some of our, our curriculums around the world. Mm. And so some of the stuff that we're doing is taking leadership on curriculum around the world. I, I talk to colleagues around the world about, hey, like, let's collectively change the way we're communicating to our students. This isn't about just Cambridge learning this. This is about us sharing it so that we can actually support society better. So, yeah, so it sounds like you, you feel that accounting is, is fundamentally crucial for society, uh, 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 massive uh, so, impact, but, uh, absolutely. but that perhaps we ourselves on the inside don't necessarily even maybe grasp that or think about it yeah. top of mind or, 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 and certainly don't communicate it uh, as well as we should. Absolutely true. Yeah. Okay. And that's why, I mean, when we came here to Cambridge, I, I, I was allowing myself to explore all of this. I mean, this is where the creative mindset is. I can't tell you how many people who are creative are like, oh, accounting is too narrow. I'm going to go somewhere else. I'm like, no, no, stay with us so that we can expand this stuff and we can, we can kind of show what we're capable of doing and we can create this kind of space that is badly needed across disciplines. We can improve. I mean, even if we don't go out of our space, accountancy isn't dying because if we were, I also do, I do this as a cool exercise. Okay, so let's say we shut accounts. Let's say we just shut down accounting tomorrow, all of it. We're going to quit doing audits. We're going to qu quit reporting. I mean, imagine, like, I mean, we talk about the market failure. Imagine, would you invest in any company? Would you, would you trust any transaction? Who's going who's gonna to enforce contracts? How do you know that you're going to get paid? I mean, it's, it's crazy. I can't even get my head around it. And yet, and yet, and yet, there are forces who are trying to make that happen. 
political forces. There are people with um, all kinds of financial incentives trying to do that, organized crime, as examples. A world without accounting. You could fly jets, but I can't do anything else, so I'd be Could I fly jets, though? Because uh, it's not entirely clear they're safe, because I don't know that the money... So let's take Rolls-Royce as an example, who creates engines, or GE, right? If they didn't have accounting or accountability for the financial resources, did they actually build the engines properly? Or did the money get taken and stolen? I don't know that I can actually fly airplanes in this scenario. And if I will, I'll give you an example, which is timely, the Russian military. There's an example there where there was, from what I understand, very little accountability for the financial flows for decades. And they deploy a military, from, from my perspective, for bad purpose, but they deploy a military and the military, the, 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 the systems aren't taken care of. So you've been doing some work, quite a lot of work lately, on disinformation. Um, tell us about that. What, what is disinformation and what are you working on? So technically disinformation is really six pieces. It's, it's um, but briefly, it's a malign actor. It's somebody who intentionally misleads others to exploit them. And the six pieces would be that you have a malign actor, that's the first piece, or a set of actors who have malign intent. The second piece is they have incentives. So there's some reason they're gonna benefit. And it does not have to be financial. Often it is financial. It could be power, it could be physical control, um, things like that, political control, things of that nature. So they have an incentive. That's the second piece. The third piece is that they're going to intentionally, that's the key piece to disinformation is the intention. They're gonna intentionally craft some misleading or false narrative. The fourth piece is through a targeted set of dissemination channels, and often we see now in social media, or it could be through newsprint or radio, um, even the financial reports perhaps, to a targeted audience, and they specifically choose an audience who they think will be vulnerable to this, this misleading information, and the idea is to exploit them. And I saw that we've been teaching fraud for a long time, financial fraud, you know, the ability to manipulate the accounting reports so that I can steal money from somebody. A Ponzi scheme is disinformation. And that's the frame in which I've been thinking about disinformation, but then we see it now everywhere. I mean, it's, it's always been everywhere, but it's so in our faces now because it's such a huge part of mainstream communication, particularly through social media channels. And I started watching it and I noticed that there were patterns across. So the same techniques, the same mechanisms, the same structure happens if I'm going to perpetrate a financial fraud or if I'm going to do a system where I'm going to try to steal an election or try to marginalize some out group and say we're the right group, they should be put away or put down or sent out or deported or whatever. And um, what, I, what I wanted to get my head around is why. Why does this stuff happen? And what are the implications now? Because we spend so much time trying to get tightly safe communication in our system, but now I've got a reader on the other side who's hearing all kinds of other stuff. Do they believe it? If we produce a financial report that's audited and they pick it up, they go, I don't believe it because I got somebody else in my ear on social media saying that auditor is not trained or something like that. They're liars or something like that. It, it, it's a very dangerous scenario. So I wanted to understand why people put disinformation into the system. Why do people believe bad information? And this led me off to talking to psychiatrists, psychologists, um, people who study in fields I've never even read. And I realized that each one of them is independently working kind of in their own silos on their own problems. There's a whole series of people looking at healthcare misinformation. There's a whole bunch of people looking at political misinformation There's a, and disinformation. There's a lot of us looking at fraud. And I wanted to collect all of us together because I think there's shared learning and I think we're working on interventions, ways to stem it and make it safer differently. And I thought, we could combine forces and actually learn from each other and maybe elevate all of our work. So when you talk about disinformation, 
uh, there's a there's a political angle there, right? And and the, uh, the the dialogue around disinformation often gets politically charged. So how do you, as an academic, weigh that your own political beliefs with your sort of orientation as an academic? Yeah, I mean. This is one of the reasons why I did the six element framework, because yes, we see disinformation in politics unambiguously, and it's very vibrant in politics in many different places. And that's one of the points that I try to continuously bring out is that it's not unique to country X or you know, political actor Y. It, it is, it's widespread, it's been historic. So one of the ways I, I kind of keep my head around it is I think about this in terms of it's a system that's applied repeatedly through history by multiple actors. And you can bring up this person in this country right now and we can talk about it and unpack it. And I'm open to do it. I'm happy to have a dialogue about President X or Prime Minister Y or leader or whatever. But to me, the important element is to use it only as an anecdote to be able to unpack the system so that we can think in terms of a broader systemic view on how do we address disinformation in general because this will continue to appear forever throughout history. And I'm more interested in all of the malign actors and all of the opportunities for exploitation, even though actor X might affect me today directly. This is a societal problem and my needs, when we're in the classroom, whatever is affecting me, it's, it, it, it's important to me, but, but the fact is that it could be a completely different context for student acts. And so what we're trying to do is create a toolkit of interventions and thought processes that applies broadly. And we, what I try to do also is to create an environment where we don't get emotional about the, the thing we're discussing, but we, we, we get curious about it. Why is it happening? How is it happening? What technique is being used? How does it make you feel? Does, do you think that's intentional that you feel that way? Um, do you think that there is a way in which you might be able to kind of intervene some way? Not only so that you don't feel that way. So one is taking care of self, which is sort of an interpersonal dynamics framework. But another one is how does one kind of blunt that and protect yourself and protect other people from this? Um, and so these are the kinds of, I think, processes and I think that's why I like the scientific perspective because when I'm reading the literature on this it's it is a broader perspective thinking holistically that even if we control it in environment X it's going to continue to materialize in environment Y and in time period whatever it's it, it's not about actor this particular person or this particular environment it's 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 a widespread phenomenon and I think that keeps me that, that, that makes it easier for me to digest and process and think in terms of a, a way. And, and actually, since you mentioned um, being a pilot, one of the things we learned when I was in the, in, in, as a pilot is we have to be able to use logic to work through thinking around emotional events. So in, in flying an airplane very quickly, many emotional events happen. And if we attend to the emotion and focus on the emotion, then we could very easily crash an airplane. And so we have to think through, okay, what's happening? Why is it happening? And, and, and deploy the logic and unpack the scenario. And that's, I think, the framing that I tend to take on a lot of these types of topics. So the Cambridge Executive Master of Accounting mm -hmm. program is pretty unique. How would you describe the culture in the program? Um, by design, and one of the reasons we came to Cambridge, by design the culture is global and it's community oriented. We're here to support each other around change initiatives and around societally oriented work and to help advance everybody's careers and everybody's impact. And that's one of the reasons why I felt that Cambridge was the place to do it. It's one of the few places where you can genuinely assemble people from literally every corner of the globe to come in and have candid, open, free flow of ideas. You and I, when we built this program, said we're going to not have answers necessarily. In many contexts, people look to the professors to know things and we're supposed to tell them everything, but we're very genuine. The culture is very inquisitive, curious, open. We're 
authentic. So we say, in fact, we build courses where we don't know the answers. And we say, hey, we don't know the answers, so we're going to bring in people who are thinking about it actively. The disinformation project was exactly that. I did not know any of the answers, but I said, I know people who are trying to get answers. So let's bring us all together. So it's a collaborative, it's a community, it's a shared learning opportunity. We share global ideas, we share global cultures, we share um, different levels. We've had students with very different skill sets, some with very, very, very deep computer training, some with very deep accountancy training, some with tax, some with law, some with, you know, they come from different training backgrounds and we try to bring all that into the room in a way such that it's shared and it's not like, hey, I know more than you on this, therefore I have a leg up. Because this isn't a, a game we play of you're going to do better than this person. It's all individual. It's all about collaborative shared learning. And that was by design and global, global perspective, global impact. So I, I, I want to get uh, j just your, your brief thoughts on uh, something here. So people listening to this might have you know, be in different places in their career, different career goals, whether it's you know a CFO kind of career path or, or a partnership uh, career path or something related to uh, you know a startup or, or regulation or policy or standard setting, whatever. Do you have just some kind of quick top career advice for anyone who might be listening? Get your head around change, risk, and people. I mean, we're sort of communicating the same things, it's the same themes, but when I think, for example, the chief financial officer, particularly at, well, at any company, but the larger companies, they're becoming much more of a decision processor. I mean, they have to allocate, first of all, they have to go get resources, and then they have to make sure those resources are used efficiently, and then they have to protect the resources, and then they have to communicate out to people on how did we spend it. That's an incredibly challenging job, and they also have to hire the right people in to do it. Um, and they're under so much more significant threats, just even within the corporation itself or in their organization, there's a lot of churn happening and a lot of change happening. And the change could be around environmental impact, as you, as you teach, um, massive amounts of thinking about risk from changes in the environment. So if I'm getting, if I'm a CFO and I'm gonna deploy resources, where am I going to deploy them? Are they safe? Are they going to be underwater? Uh, things like that you have to think through. So how you protect resources, are the resources even going to be available to you? Uh, are the prices going to go skyrocketing because they're scarce now due to climate change as, an, as one example? So it's thinking in terms of about where are the risks, the disinformation risks coming in. If, if I were, for example, as a chief financial officer of a startup and I wanted to access capital from an investment group, a, a, a group of VCs or angel investors, what are they hearing about me in the public media? Is it true? Do I need to convince them that it's all lies? How do I work through the information space? Because they probably already have a pre-narrative. So how do I work with them on that? Because I need access to their capital. And what if I report back to them about performance and I've run it through a very carefully constructed system, will they believe it? That's a disinformation risk. And so there's a lot here that, that chief financial officers, for example, need to know. And it is around human beings and it is around risk and risk thinking and being able to change quickly. We might need to change our communication style to them. We might need to change how we pitch to them. For example, if we bring in, using the disinformation as an, as an example, um, one of our colleagues here, Sander van der Linden, over in the Social Psychology Decision-Making Laboratory, he's written extensively with colleagues on this notion of pre-bunking and trying to get ahead of false narratives. It may be that I'm reaching out to an investor audience or to a, um, a, uh, a, a consumer audience. Like Some of the consumers are taking on a lot of noise in the market, and they might think that our product isn't working or our product is unsafe. Well, I need to think as a CFO for us to get cash flows. One of the things I need to think about is what's our communication strategy to counteract that? And so understanding kind of the psychological research on why these false beliefs exist is critical now. 
you can't just simply say, oh, I'll go get money, I'll deploy the money, and then we'll send product out. You have to think in terms of the risks around you and getting on top of it. And I think just thinking more organically, holistically around this is critical for any leadership career path, which, um, and, and, and I will also add that it has to, it has to also take a global perspective. You could be setting up your operations to only work exclusively in country X. You could be intending to never, ever, ever interact with country Y, which might be halfway around the world. But if country Y has a pandemic, that thing's spreading probably to you at some point, and it's gonna affect your operations. Or if country Y has some sort of civil conflict, that could spread to you as well because now all of a sudden people are affected by the civil conflict. You can see that happening now today where there's a regional conflict and people are very emotional about it. And that affects how they interact with each other everywhere around the world. Or it may also affect things like forced human migration. You might have refugee crisis and they're coming over and that affects everything from demand for your product to supply of labor, to access to resources, things of that nature. So I think just thinking like a global mindset, thinking as though we need to pay attention around the world, we need to know what people are thinking around the world, we need to be proactive and think ahead and anticipate and be like fluid and, and agile I think is critical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a sort of de decision making in a highly uncertain, maybe increasingly uncertain environment. Very much so, yeah. yeah. People watching this might be wondering if this is the right program for them. Mm -hmm. So who did you have in mind when we were thinking about building this program? Um, the student we have in mind, I had in mind, was somebody who is innately curious and who wants societal impact and who has a global mindset. I mean, that's throughout all of this and who actually understands that like information is incredibly important and that we actually have clean communications so that we can help support people. And somebody who is sort of agitated in a good way around status quo. So in many cases, some of them are kind of bored or they're like, oh, I think we could do this better. Like I always have a sense we could do this better, but I haven't quite figured out how we get there or how I get past the resistance. This is the kind of person we had in mind. and. Also somebody who values having a dialogue with somebody who is completely different and comes from a completely different world perspective, global perspective, and you can have a dinner or sit down and just talk. And you may be completely different age, you may be from completely different backgrounds or lived experiences, and you're just curious to hear how they experience the world differently and even why are they here? I mean, one of the coolest things I've seen, which is organic, is just listening to each of them and discover why are you here, even if we ask that question. Because I know why we think they should be here, and we often match incredibly well to people on that, but it's really cool to see that that, that question, there's a common theme around all the students, around I'm curious, I want to do societal impact, I want to do global impact, I'm kind of agitated. I want to do bigger decision making that matters. Um, I want to have control rights instead of listening to somebody who I just don't think has the right way of pushing forward the needed change. Uh, and, and these are the kind of students, but, but, but there's nuance around that. And when they sit and they talk to each other, well, why are you here? It's really kind of fun and colorful because it's all different ways of framing around that. So you, you use the word agitated. Do you try to get people more agitated? I like to use the word dissonance. So there's a psychological term about dissonance where you are pretty strong in your belief system and then we can introduce an idea that just doesn't sit right with that. And that becomes a catalyst for discussion and curiosity if it's handled properly, if it's safe. So often when I hear students who come in with very strong positions on an idea, we challenge them, but we do it politely and we say, hey, what about this? What if I took you here? For example, one of the dissonance questions is, what if we shut down, we did it earlier, what if we shut down accounting and audit completely tomorrow? Which I don't think anybody I've seen in any kind of classroom has ever thought about that. What does it look like? That's a sort of a weird safe shock to the system. It's very extreme. 
the probability of that happening is very low, but it allows you to think through that is a pretty dark, dangerous place for everybody, unless you're the one who controls everything. I mean, if you're the dictator, that's a wonderful place to be because then you're not accountable to anybody. But if you're not that person or if you're not seriously in that level, then it's a very dangerous place to be. So then you can go, okay, well, that makes a lot of sense about why I want to I want to go along a path of improvement. And, and we introduce that all the time in the classroom. And particularly in the global financial reporting type framework where we'll explore existing infrastructure and then we'll stretch that and say, well, what if we tried it this way? What if we tried it this way? Um, and people get pretty uncomfortable and they argue with each other, but it's a safe discussion. And then we try to find a solution that makes sense for everybody. So these change, th these change initiatives and these, these efforts often start with some level of dissatisfaction in the system as you currently see them. Is there a way that you sort of help students cultivate awareness of how systems need to be improved? Um, yeah, I mean, we're constantly dissatisfied as human beings. I think every single person I've worked with has some angst around some situation. Often we can tease it out when we say waiting in line at the supermarket or waiting in line to even in traffic, sitting in traffic, just sitting in traffic, and you get agitated sitting in traffic. And I, my, my mind goes first through the frustration of it, and then I go, I would build a better system. This is a broken system. Why am I sitting here? What could I do to change this? And I even go into ways of, well, you know, maybe I can invent a helicopter or something that could get me out of here. And, and just having that kind of dissatisfaction with the system or having that agitation is a seed. And then what we do is we say, okay, why did you feel that way? How passionate were you about that agitation? And is it enough that if I gave you control rights, you would blow the system up? That's a terrible way of framing it. You would change the system dramatically or you would try to implement change. And often we say, eh, it's not that big. You know, example, in a supermarket, if there's a line and it's long, it bothers me. And I would maybe say, well, I'll do a simple change initiative of opening up more lanes or opening up, you know, fixing some of the broken registers, self-checkout. But beyond that, I'm not going to put a lot of effort in because I don't care that much. So a lot of it is teasing out the emotional connection and how strong of a change, it, how strongly emotionally tied am I to the need for change. And in some cases, we find very strong passion around it. And that's where we say, OK, you clearly have a lot of passion around the need for change. Let's focus on how would one approach this. And once we do that, then we need to kick in the logic skills. And we need to kind of tamp down the passion and say, you're emotional, let's kind of tamp that down, break down the problem. Where is the problem? Where is the resistance? What would a change initiative look like? And how could one break it down so that we could get it in staged and try to implement it? And that's, those are the kinds of things that typically um, uh, happen. Or what's holding you back? Like, why are you not, why haven't you already started it if you care that much about it? So these are the kinds of conversations that we often have. And often when we do that, the answers reveal the path forward. So how can people learn more about the projects you're working on and about the program? So a lot of the projects I discuss on LinkedIn. We have a web page on LinkedIn for the Cambridge Disinformation Summit, particularly where I put a lot of resources and articles and some of the research my colleagues and I are doing. So that's one of the places. We also have a website, the Center for Financial Reporting and Accountability hosts a website which lists some of our conferences. The Executive Masters of Accounting program, we have a website. We also carry a lot of presence on LinkedIn and do dialogue on LinkedIn to contact you. I know the website has, for, that, for, for the program, has a CV review um, page as well, events as well. So there, it lists a lot of events that people can attend, including I think we had this one posted there. Um, the CV review I highly recommend for anybody interested to have a dialogue with you and see whether there's kind of a, a way in which this could potentially amplify careers and that, that discussion could start with the CV review as one example. Great. Thanks so much, Alan. Thanks for your time. It's a pleasure. Uh, Thank you. Appreciate for it. And thanks to everyone for joining us. And if you'd like to get more information about the Executive Master of Accounting program, please don't hesitate to get in touch.